can see Laura begin to grimace a little bit. She said, he's getting awfully windy. Texas term. Um, which, uh, let me. Uh, 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 just, uh, you know, you, 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 I, I really, I, I, I'm not, I'm serious about. It. You, 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 you'll be. Let me, let me, let, let me, let me. There would have been a deficit, but there wouldn't have been the commiserate, uh, the, 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 the kick to our economy. One, two, three, four. Uh, let me put it this way. Uh, I, I, I don't know, Garrett, how to... How to uh, you know, I, 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 I... And, and, and uh, just, just to... to uh, I, I, Everybody knows that it makes no sense that you send a kid to the emergency room for a treatable illness like asthma, they end up taking up a hospital bed, it costs when if you they just gave you gave them treatment early, and they got some treatment and a, a breathalyzer or an inhalator, not a breathalyzer. <laughs> I haven't had much sleep in the last 48 hours. So and over the last 15 months, we've traveled uh, to every corner of the United States. Uh, I've now been in 57 states. I think one left to go. Uh, one left to go. Uh, Alaska and Hawaii I was not allowed to go to, even though I really wanted to visit, but my staff would not uh, justify it. Four more years of failed Bush economic policies. Are you ready for the change that we all need? Then no matter what your party, gender, or race or religion, please help me today in welcoming the next Vice President of the United States, John McCain. Nothing coming up behind Make my way through the darkness I can't feel nothing but Seeing them blunder that, you know? Wow. It's always funny when someone famous, you know, uh, stumbles over some words or makes a bad introduction. And, and you see an introduction. You know, that guy had that written down. He had John McCain. He read it on his paper. Uh, you remember that for a while. Uh, today, as we go in our uh, continue in our rule breaker series, uh, the last uh, sermon in this series, we're going to consider uh, an introduction that needs to be redone. It's our introduction to Jesus Christ, and uh, we're going to see how God breaks the rules of religion uh, by reaching out to some wise men, or uh, the magi, as they are called, and. As we do, what we'll discover is that Christmas introduces us to Christ in a different way than perhaps what our cultural story uh, uses Christmas to introduce us to Christ. Now, through our Euro, uh, Rule Breakers series, uh, we've talked about how God uh, broke the rules of nature and how he broke the rules of law and society. And we've done that by looking at the traditional characters of Mary and Joseph and the shepherds. And today we turn to the wise men. The wise men are called magi in this passage. And they were astrologers from Persia, or once had been ancient Babylon. And we think about the wise men or the magi, we probably have uh, an image of, you know, little boys in bathrobes with towels as turbans on their head and they're carrying little boxes. And, and all the boys want to be the wise men in the Christmas pageant because you get something to carry and, and you're, you're very important, you know, you're dressed sometimes in purple. And, but our impression of the Magi really misses the point of, of what God is doing. And you don't hear this much. Uh, uh, what the casual observer misses is that they were magicians. And when we say magician in this, we're not talking about somebody that makes something disappear, takes a young lady and puts her in a box and saws her in half. Uh, the magician in, in this day was, was someone that um, could, they thought, the religion and, and these magicians thought that they could control the gods by different spells and incantations that they could get the gods to do what they wanted the gods to do, and that was called magic. And they could also tell the future. That was called divination, and they could tell the future 
you know, and that's a lot of power. So they were always in the king's court. They were the Chaldeans. And uh, they were in the king's court. They were very important men. And uh, they can make things happen the way that the king wanted them to happen. So really, when, when we think of the Magi, we should be thinking of present-day uh, psychics and astrologers. And you probably never thought of them that way. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, for a while, there was a lady called Miss Cleo. Uh, you guys are probably too young for Miss Cleo. Um, she was on TV and for a while uh, used her skill at telling people things about themselves in the future and it was called Psychic Friends Hotline. Remember Psychic Friends Hotline? Some of you older people, if you paid a few dollars a minute, you could talk to a psychic and they could tell you things. Uh, they could contact uh, dead relatives and connect you with them. Um, they're still there. Uh, Googled them, found Psychic Hotline. They're on the internet now. Internet, internet. Now, uh, I, I, you can make uh, 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 you can make a, a a booper booper tape out of what I say. Right? They're still there. <laughs> there we go. But if you go to the psychic hotline now on the internet, what you'll find is like hundreds of people who are. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get past this, am I? Hundreds of people. Uh, most of them look to be uh, from what we would say an ethnic origin. They, they look to be from India or Pakistan uh, just by their, their accent. Got nothing against that. But anyway, they're sitting in front of their computer all day waiting for someone to click on them and then they'll get a dollar or two dollars a minute to tell them things about themselves that's in the secret world. They're still out there. So the Magi were running their own kind of ancient uh, psychic friends network way back there in Persia and God reached out to these guys. So, so here, here it is from scripture, Matthew 2, 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. And they asked, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and we've come to honor him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born. And they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote. You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from them the time when the star had first appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child. When you found him, report to me so that I too may go and honor him. When they heard the king, they went and looked. The star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary his mother. Falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened their treasure chests and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route. So when the Magi uh, arrive in, in Jerusalem, they, they formally introduce themselves to Herod to fulfill this custom and protocol that day. And the Magi were from the east and like I said, probably from ancient Babylon where the people of Judah had been in captivity. And remember that while the people of Judah had been in captivity in Babylon, that the prophet Isaiah was the current prophet. And, and he had wrote a lot about this new kingdom, and this new king that would come one day. And, you know, here they are, they see a star and they expect a king. So maybe they had those scrolls, likely did. And... We're looking for this king that Isaiah was talking about. But they came because they saw this star in the sky, and they were astrologers. Um, actually, the horoscope uh, came out of ancient Babylon. That's where it first came from. And so they were always looking to the stars to, to try to predict what was going to happen. And they believed that they could read in the stars the fate of a person. So when this new star appeared and they had... 
these writings of Isaiah, more than likely uh, they headed out looking for this king that had been prophesied. And the presence wouldn't have been out of Norm and Herod's court. Uh, they're dignitaries for a foreign company, country. He would have received them. And they would have fit in uh, with him fine. They would not have fit in with the rest of the Jewish culture. Herod was not of the Jewish culture um, because of the practice of astrology that they, they had. And you see, there's the problem with this. Uh, magicians are, are people who cast spells to control gods were strictly for, forbidden in Israel. Uh, forbidden as well were people who practiced divination. Uh, and that day they, they might look at the way that the birds were flying to tell the fate of something or the way the chickens ate their food or they might look at the liver of a goat to try to get some knowledge. And that secret knowledge was, of course, held very tightly by these uh, magi and it was passed down at a cost because they made a lot of profit in it. They made a lot of money, a lot of power. But it's forbidden for the Israelites because this is idolatry you see, to try to control gods and to worship these other gods. And there's a lot of prohibition in Scripture, both old and new. I'm just going to read one passage, but it, it kind of shows you the seriousness uh, of this offense in Deuteronomy 18, uh, 10 to 12. There must not be anyone among you who passes his son or daughter through the fire. Yeah, that's child sacrifice. Who practices divination is a sign reader, fortune teller, sorcerer, or spellcaster, who converses with ghosts or spirits or communicates with the dead. All who do these things are detestable to the Lord. It's on account of these detestable practices that the Lord your God is driving these nations out before you. That's just one place. It's throughout uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, when the, the church emerges, they have some real conflicts with these other nations that, that use magic and divination to try to control the gods. And yet, you know, God reached out to them. God chose these magicians, these practitioners um, of what would be called today the occult, and that broke the rules of religion. God sent out this birth announcement uh, about his son to a foreign land, to these people that were breaking the rules of Israel. He sent out this birth announcement and this message in a star, and, and God was not saying, okay, now divination is all right. What God was sending to the world was so important. The Messiah, the Son of God, that he wanted everyone to have a chance, you see. He wanted to make sure that unreached and untouched people could begin to discover this Emmanuel, this God with us. And by using a star, a star God just kind of blew the top off of religion. He's kind of broke the rules there. His son would not be confined by religious expectations. So why would God tell the Magi? Uh, one obvious reason is because Jesus is the Savior of the world, not just the Jews. And we remember that from the news from last week with the shepherds, as it was announced to them, a savior of the world for all, not just those who were keeping the law, but for all people. And then later on, John would say, for God so loved the world, not for God so loved the religious people, you see. So the Magi found the king of the Jews because... God broke the rules of religion and to speak to them in a language they would hear. And by following the star through which God spoke to them, the Magi were introduced to Jesus. Now, God is a God of all people, and that had always been his plan. This wasn't anything new that was taking place here. God had entered into covenant with a, a few men, first Abraham and then Moses, to form a people who would embody uh, the truth for all people. And they were to live in such a way that this nation that was filled with their truth and lived by their principles and treated each other with such fairness and compassion that that nation would be a light to the other nations. Isaiah 42.6 uh, says, I, the Lord, have called you for a good reason, speaking to the nation of Israel. I will grasp your hand and guard you and give you as a covenant to the people 
as a light to the nations. You see that in there? God was using the covenant with Israel to, to reach the world. And, and then later on in Isaiah 60, verse 3, he says, Nations will come to your light and kings to your dawning radiance. That always was the vision. That always was the mission. It never was that God would just have a chosen people and stay confined to them. But they were to live with such integrity to God and such love and compassion that others would say, surely your God is superior to all of my gods. And, and you're Yahweh, your living God. I, I want to worship him. That was the plan. We find at Pentecost, you know, after Jesus was uh, crucified, and resurrected and then ascended at Pentecost that the Holy Spirit fell upon all the people. It went from 120 to thousands. It says of, of every nation, men and women, slaves and free, different skin colors. That was the promise. You see, it was being realized. God has, has a habit of using outsiders, uh, people who don't fit into the mold of religion, uh, there's a long list. You, you, you have to pay attention here or you'll think that in order to win approval by God that you look a certain way and act a certain way and talk a certain way and, and have the right skin color and the right gender and all that, but that's not what happened. Well, we have people in the story like Rahab. Remember her, the, the prostitute that lived in the wall, Jericho, that, that hid the spies? when Joshua, Joshua was going to uh, come into the promised land and, and Rahab, although she be a prostitute, although she be a Canaanite, became one of the ancestors of Jesus Christ. There she is listed. Uh, Jewish uh, legend has it that she actually married Joshua, that she was one of the most beautiful women in the world, and yet she wasn't an Israelite. Or I think of Ruth. Ruth was... Uh, a Moabite, that's code for outsider, okay? And Ruth also gets brought into the family, brought into the covenant. And she becomes an ancestor of Jesus Christ as well. Grandmother of, of uh, David, an ancestor of Jesus. I think of, of how God used other nations um, the way that he wanted to. Uh, used Egypt so often to be a sanctuary. Abraham takes two trips down to Egypt and is find sanctuary there in a time of famine. Later on, uh, Joseph would, would go there, and Joseph's uh, brothers and his father would end up taking residence there, and God would use Egypt as a, a land that, that worshiped Ra, the, the sun god, but he uses Egypt in order to be kind of this little... Um, incubation nation where Israel grows up and comes out as a mighty nation. You see, if God had only revealed himself and reached out to people who were worthy, he would never have reached out to anyone because no one is worthy. Everyone is unworthy. None are worthy of, of the revelation. And I, I think this is just a, such a crucial thing that I hope that we can get. Uh, it, you begin to look at the Old Testament in a different way, but, but this desire for God to bless all people, not just a few, is, is what I think the Pharisees had missed. You see, because they were trying to make everybody into this holy nation that looked the same and talked the same and acted the same and, and did all these ritualistic things. And yet Jesus said, had you known my father, you would know me. But you didn't know my father, so you didn't know me. And I think that that's what the, the Pharisees missed, was that God was reaching out to the world. From the very beginning, his desire wasn't just to save a few, but that all might come to faith. Now, we, we see today that God broke the rules of religion so that he could let wise man astrologers from Persia know that the king of Jews had come. And once again, Christmas introduces us to Christ, and God brought some friends of the psychic hotline a long ways to worship the king of kings. And there's no mention of any visits to Bethlehem by the rulers, the religious rulers that lived in the temple and in Jerusalem. There's no mention of that. Just these guys from the East. Sometimes our religion uh, can get in the way of our worship. You know, we, we get so concerned 
uh, about rules and disciplines and the practice of Christianity that we overlook or even ignore Christ. And, of course, we've just gone through a season where here in our culture that that is becoming even more and more the practice. Uh, that's why we need a, a rule-breaking story like Christmas that takes us back out of all of the trappings, out of the cultural stuff, and we can see what God was really up to. We need to be reminded once again who Jesus is and why God sent him in the heart of God for all people. Because God will break the rules, even his own rules of religion, as he did in this passage, so that anyone and everyone might meet Christ. And as we're introduced to Christ to the person of Christ, over the rules of religion. And as we share this revelation with others, the Holy Spirit begins to work in that. And, and the Holy Spirit breaks into our lives and, and does some things that, that normally wouldn't happen, wouldn't be according to our script. And he always surprises us by, by who he reaches out to, you see. The real Christ brings new life, and Christmas reminds us of how this new life changes us in our world. So as Christmas people, th th this is really our mission, you know, is, is to let the Spirit tell the story, break some rules in, in the culture, in our society, and break some, even some rules of religion so that anyone might hear. Uh, a few years ago, there's a great book written by a uh, young man, David Platt. Uh, it was called uh, Radical. And it shows, uh, it's a Christian book, it, it shows the importance of introducing people to Christ. And in, in the book, he spends a lot of time linking the culture wars um, in America, talking about that. And gosh, it, it, that was 2010 when the book was written, and now in 2014. Uh, those culture wars are much more intense than what they even were back in 2010. And his point is that Christians are called to preach the gospel to all, not just to those who we think agree with us or, or share our political opinions or who fit the idea of someone that God wants to reach. And he begins this with a reading of Romans 10. And I want to give you his method here because it kind of shocked me. Romans 10, 13 to 15, all who call on the Lord's name will be saved. So how can they call on someone they don't have faith in? And how can they have faith in someone they haven't heard of? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? So what, what David does, he says, well, let's take this progression in this, in this passage of Scripture, and let's look at the verbs in reverse. The first, then, is that God sends us. You know, how can they preach unless they are sent? God sends us. Everyone is sent. And no, you're not sent perhaps to a foreign land, but, but you have a mission from God. Every, every person does. And then he continues to move in reverse order to the next verb. He says, we preach, and we're sent to preach the gospel. So, so how do you preach? Well, he, preach here means tell, proclaim. And it's not just what, you know, some really gifted, good-looking guy does on Sunday morning in front of you every week. But, but, but this is what you do with what we do with our lives. We, we, we are to proclaim. And, and with our lives, with our actions, and also with our mouths and uh, words and action. And he says the next step is that people hear. If we are preaching, people will hear. And that's, that's not teaching that everybody is going to hear, but it's teaching that some people are going to hear or will believe. And the last two steps are simple. When people hear, some believe, then they call the name of the Lord, and they are saved. So then uh, David looks at, at this progression, and he asks a key question. He says, look back over the progression and ask one question. Is there any place where this can break down? You know, it seems, seems like a great... Uh, plan of action, right? So he says, where's the weakness in there? Where's the place where this can break down? Obviously, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's God's job. No breakdown there. Everyone who calls, uh, believes, will call. Many who hear, but not all, will believe. And people will hear the gospel when we preach it to them. And 
God is most definitely still in the business of sending his servants. And so he says that means there's only one potential breakdown in this progression when servants of God do not preach the gospel to all peoples. Hmm. See, we're the plan. There's no plan B. God doesn't have a plan B. You're the stars, all right, that appear in other people's lives. Other people get the revelation through you. You are the ones who are sent. You're the ones who, uh, another metaphor is to scatter the seed on the ground that is being plowed sometimes in this world by some difficulties in life. That's, that's who we are. That's God's plan. And yet the church often acts as if we own God. And we we, we got to fight those atheists. Oh, man. we we, we got to launch something against the atheists. we we got we got to stop Islam. we we got to argue Islam out of the marketplace, you know. And God is going, hey, wait a minute. Aren't, aren't they mine? Those, those are members of my psychic network over there. What are, you, what are you messing with them about? Leave that up to me. You just preach the gospel. Just, just tell them about the love of God. How God loved everyone so much that he sent his only son to die for everyone. Not just for the people that you pick out to be in your club. For everyone. Tell them about my love. Love your neighbor. Love me. A love that's so great, you know, that there's the death of my son involved in it. For some reason, we feel kind of insecure with that. You know, I'm coming clean. I feel insecure in that. It's, I can be so good at arguing theology with someone else. And there's a place for that within the church. But there's no place for that on Facebook. <laughs> to, to argue theology with someone that you don't know, really, in some arena like that, there's, that just isn't there. We, all we can do is just give them the gospel, give them the good news as it's been given to us. And that is, is that I don't deserve God's love, but he gave it to me. And I know that he loves me because he died for my sin. That's all we can do. Culture wars, man, they're, they're hot today, aren't they? Well, God's not losing. <laughs> God never loses. God's not at war with anyone. God's not at war with A and E. God's not at war with old Phil Robertson. Uh, but God just waits, I think. He, he, just, he just waits for us to, to execute his plan, just to preach the gospel, just to tell him about Jesus, and let God work the rest of it out. We, we are to be his, his stars, those who, who, who hear... Uh, leading others uh, who are hearing the Lord uh, to the Lord. Uh, Jesus is not the Savior of Christians. That always upsets people when I say this. The church does not belong to Christians. Jesus is not the Savior of Christians. Jesus is the Savior of the world. The, world, the, the mission of the church is to the world, not to Christians. And the reality that some say that he doesn't exist doesn't change reality. The, the fact that people are going to say, you know, blah, 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 this is why God doesn't exist, so what? It doesn't change reality. Reality is what is left after you stop believing. Reality is still there, you see. And so it's really not our fight. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is the Savior of the world. So as I'm talking here and I'm talking about... Um, you know, people that don't fit the mold of Christianity and what the church says you should act like and talk like and look like, and people that argue with you a lot. I mean, they're, actually, the people that, that, that get the most upset about our story are probably the ones that are closest to the Lord. They're, the people that don't care, that are apathetic, those are the ones that I'm really worried about. But the people that get upset, that get mad, well, God's probably doing something in their lives, you know. So who comes to mind for you? So, oh, my, Don, you were talking all theory until now. Now who comes to mind for you? Who's, whose face pops into your mind as we talk about these, these uh, 
magicians and these astrologers from the East and these people that are a long way from God and how God reached out to them. Who do you think of? Well, will you be faithful to, to live the gospel, to preach the gospel to them? I hope you will. That's your mission field. God still called you to go. Um, your plan A, there is no plan B, remember? And God is just waiting, waiting for us. Let's, let's spend a little bit of time in prayer. As deep cries out